What is love? Well, it's complicated, and maybe that's what makes it so interesting. Ask a hundred different people for a definition of love, and they will probably give you a hundred different answers. In English, it sometimes has a very strong meaning. It can mean affection, loyalty, care, compassion, concern, devotion. You can love your family, your children, your spouse, your country. But love in English can also mean whatever random passion you happen to have at the moment. You can love the latest viral dance craze or a caramel McFlurry. Let me give you two classic definitions of love. They're a little bit abstract, but I think they're useful. And I think that they express the two central aspects that will be true for any genuine love. The first definition, love seeks union. We want to be united with the one that we love. If I love someone, I care for them, I miss them. I want to be with them, I want to share my life with them. Think of the opposite. If I told you I was passionately in love with someone, but I had absolutely no intention of ever seeing them again, you'd be a little bit suspicious. So love seeks union. And the second definition, love seeks the good of the other. If I love someone, I want to do good for them. I want to help them. It's not just about what I take from this relationship. It's what I give as well. Maybe there is a cost for me, a sacrifice. I'm trying to look beyond my own needs and think about what will really benefit the other person. Sometimes love is just hard work. There's a lot of give and take. It's interesting that in the Italian language, there are two ways of saying, I love you. Ti amo means simply, I love you, ti amo. You say it when you're dating someone or when you're falling in love. It's the love of union. And the other phrase in Italian is ti voglio bene, ti voglio bene. It means I wish you well or I want what is good for you. It's the love of sacrifice, but it's also about affection. And in many ways, it's got an even deeper meaning than just saying ti amo, I love you. It implies that there's a relationship of trust, of commitment, that you really want to honour and believe in this person. Both of these meanings are in the Bible. The love that God has for his people Israel in the Old Testament is like the love of a bridegroom for his bride. And interestingly, Jesus speaks about himself as the bridegroom who longs to be united with his bride, the community of the church. The other meaning is there as well, the sacrificial meaning. God calls his people to love the poor, the sick, the widow, the stranger, the outcast. And Jesus asks us to be servants of each other. He gives us the example of his own life. He goes on his knees to wash the feet of his disciples. He gives generously his body and blood at the Last Supper, and he gives his very life in sacrifice on the cross. So love seeks union, and love gives itself in sacrifice. A beautiful example of this for me is the life of Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker Movement in New York in the 1930s a long way from the tranquility of this village here in the south of England. Dorothy Day was someone who gave her life completely in love for the poor. She opened soup kitchens on the street corners of New York. This was the time of the Great Depression. She set up refuge centers for the homeless. She called them houses of hospitality. And she even bought a farm in the countryside outside the city so that people from the inner cities could have an experience of beauty and community. It was a life of total sacrifice, but she did it out of love. She loved the people she cared for with such affection. She lived with them, she shared her life with them. In fact, it wasn't about doing good for them, it was about living with them. And even more, it wasn't about us or them. It was about a community of brothers and sisters living together. 
Now, it might sound like a recipe for chaos, and certainly there were a few crises along the way, but it worked. And it shows you that love needs passion and affection, but it also needs sacrifice and sometimes sheer hard work. Now, this is true not just for New York in the 1930s. It's true for us today in our ordinary lives, wherever we are. It's true for our families, our friends, our communities, our schools, our places of work. We need a love that seeks union. And we need a love that seeks the good of the other. And when these two things come together, that is the deepest meaning of love. It's love. By definition, I don't know, is it massive mutual respect? I honestly don't know. Love is looking at somebody and realizing how special they are, and you love them for everything they have, and even their flaws and quirky bits. It's about the only thing you can't explain through logic. We live in a world of cause and effects and physics and chemistry, and everything is, you know, calculable, and yet love completely defies that. It's, it's the thing that makes life meaningful and makes humans unique. What is love? It doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doesn't exist. <laughs> love is a choice. It's not a fluttery feeling that um, you have. It's something that you choose to commit to every day, every month, every year. Um, the first thing I thought was that it's self-sacrifice, but then I think it's also just about caring for someone else and being willing to let them care for you. I think love is not just a relationship. I think love is also um, the feeling you have, you know, for people. It's, it's the feeling you can have for your child or your spouse or your parents, but also for a friend or also for a stranger even, someone who just affects you in a certain way. I think love is, uh, is all-encompassing. It's, it's huge. It's everywhere. A connection that makes you put someone else sometimes ahead of you. Not all the times, but sometimes ahead of you. So people can have many different theories about love, but what does it actually look like in practice? St. Martin of Tours was a young Roman soldier in the fourth century. He's riding along on his horse in the coldest part of winter, and he sees a beggar sitting by the side of the road near to the gates of the city. Martin's got nothing to give him, but in a moment of inspiration, he draws his sword, cuts his cloak in half, and gives one half of the cloak to the beggar. That very night, Martin has a dream, and in this dream, he sees Jesus wearing the half of the cloak that he's given to the beggar. And Jesus says to the angels, see how Martin has clothed me in his own cloak. It's a true story, and it's a beautiful symbol of the love of neighbor that all Christians are called to. Jesus said, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Then he went further and said, love one another as I have loved you. And he went even further and said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. It's a radical call to love without calculation, without conditions, without expecting any reward in return. It's tough, and sometimes it's hard to expect. It's a love of sacrifice that sometimes calls us to something that seems to be beyond the call of duty. But it doesn't mean that we have to become everyone's doormat. 
Sometimes we need to stand up for ourselves, to stand up for others, to stand up for justice. And it doesn't mean that life is without joy. So many of the encounters that Jesus has with others are full of joy. There's this lovely phrase, life grows when it's given away. And in fact, we often experience that the more we give, the more we receive. Mother Teresa was a nun in India, teaching in a girls' school, doing great work. But one day she felt an inner calling. She felt that she was called to leave the safety of the monastery and the school and to go out into the slums of Calcutta to serve the poorest of the poor. She wanted to be with those who had nothing, to share their lives and to bring the light of Christ into the darkness of the slums of Calcutta. She brought the sick and the dying into her homes and cared for them. She educated the abandoned children she met and gave them food and hope. She gathered nuns, sisters around her, so they could share in this work in some of the poorest places in the world. Mother Teresa went beyond the walls of her settled life to seek out her neighbour in the poorest of the poor. She is such a beautiful example of Christian love and selfless joy. We may not follow exactly the same path that she trod, but we can seek to love others as she did and to give our lives in the service of others in the ordinary circumstances of our own situation. She was simply following the example of Jesus himself. At the Last Supper, he took off his outer garments and went down to wash the feet of his disciples. It's a symbol of humble service as the Son of God goes on his knees before us. But it's also done with great tenderness and compassion. He is a friend amongst friends, a brother amongst brothers. In the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan is probably the greatest illustration of Christian love. A man has been beaten, stripped, and left abandoned by the side of the road. And a Samaritan stranger is the only one who's willing to cross the road and help him. He's moved with compassion. He goes to him, he binds up his wounds, and then he cares for him in the local place of lodging. The Good Samaritan goes the extra mile. His love is kind, compassionate, generous, practical, selfless. It is a sacrificial love, but it's full of such tenderness and affection as well. This is the kind of love we are called to have for others, for those who are close to us, who often can be the most difficult to love, family, colleagues at work, neighbours for those we see every day but maybe never acknowledge, for the stranger, the unexpected visitor, the foreigner, and especially for the poor, the sick, the lonely, the unloved, the elderly, the dying. This is what it means to love your neighbour. This is what it means to love as Christ loved. I think it was my dad. So he is a very unassuming person. I don't think he'd have thought of himself as the most loving person, but he was the most selfless person I've ever known. And he devoted his life. He never took holidays, you know, to his, to his patients. He was a doctor and to my sister, myself and my mum. And his whole life was about service and dedication without without making a big deal of it. He, he just lived that. Yeah, it would either be my wife or my mum. I've been incredibly lucky to have, you know, a very loving wife and mother. I'd say it's a tie between 
my boyfriend and my best friend. Both of them have, a, a, they care about others in very different ways, but when they care about someone, they will give them their 100% and will not hold back anything. My son, yeah, eight-year-old, eight-and-a-half-year-old son, you know, he's uh, the most loving person. He's lovely and he loves people and he hugs and he gives them freely and tells me and everyone else he loves them every day. I feel I should say God, uh, but I also uh, mention my mom for sure. She's a very loving person and I wouldn't be here or the person I am if it wasn't for her. A lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him this question. He said to him, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest commandment and the first. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbour as yourself. The most important thing in our lives is to know the love of God and to love him in return. This is our deepest calling. It's also our deepest desire, even if we're only dimly aware of it. St. Augustine said, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We can never find ultimate happiness in the passing things of this world. This was the experience of Moses in the Old Testament. He was a shepherd in the wilderness looking after his sheep. Imagine him here in the wilderness of the Sussex Downs with the sheep behind me. And he had an encounter with God in the form of a bush that was aflame with fire. It kept burning and burning and burning, but it was never consumed. So Moses turned aside from the path he was on and went to see what was happening. And as he came to the bush, the Lord spoke to him by name. He said to him, Moses, Moses, take off your sandals, for the place you are standing on is holy ground. Moses had a profound experience of the presence of God. It changed everything. And he had to turn aside and to take off his shoes as a sign of his humility and of his worship. It's the same for us. Deep in our hearts, there is a longing for God, but we need to turn aside for a moment, to search for him, to make space for him, to pray, to worship, and we need to take off our shoes, to be honest about the things that need changing in our life, to say sorry for our sins and our wrongdoing, and to let go of the things that are damaging and harmful. It's impossible to love God as we need to without the help of Jesus Christ. He is our friend, our brother, our saviour. If we believe in him, he unites us with himself. He fills us with his Holy Spirit and he lifts us up to the Father in his own glorious prayer. If we put Jesus Christ in the centre, everything else falls into place. It doesn't mean all our difficulties disappear, but we can make sense of them and we know how to move forward. One of my great heroes is St Francis of Assisi. As a young man, he was trying to live the Christian life, but he didn't really know where life was taking him. One day, he visited a church with two friends. He found a Bible and he opened it at random. And his eyes fell upon the passage where Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, you must sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. The words spoke to his heart, and he felt with real conviction that Jesus was calling him to live a life of complete poverty and Francis found such joy and freedom in following Christ in that way and speaking about him to others. People used to say that when they met Francis, it was as if they were meeting Jesus himself. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to sell all your possessions and take to the streets like St. Francis. Every Christian has a unique vocation and a different way of living their faith. But I do hope that you can discover the joy that Francis found in following Christ. The love of Christ set him free, free to love God, free to love others. That freedom is something that we all long for, even if we will live it in different ways. And if we do discover it for ourselves, we'll want to share it with others too. St. Catherine of Siena said, if you become who you are meant to be, you will set the world on fire. And then, at the end of our life, when we leave this world, we have the hope of sharing eternally in the fire of God's love, of seeing the glory that Moses saw in the burning bush and seeing the glory that shines from the face of Jesus Christ. You know, if, if, even if you were to look up love in, in the dictionary, you might get the black and white definition, but love is more than that. And it's, it's experienced and felt and given and received. I, I feel like a fairly young Christian. I'm not young, but my, my sort of coming to faith is comparatively recent. But I do recall moments from, literally from 16 onwards, where I'd be doing whatever the heck I wanted on the whole. Any time I wanted, I was free to do what I wanted. But I always had this 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 pull to God. Whether I th in fact, yes, I think I was prepared to say that was God, even though I hadn't defined it much further than that. I'm not sure it's Road to Damascus. I'm not sure they're, they're big incidents. Although the one there is one because it was very much that polarization between light and dark. My second child was born, and so I was coming to London because actually, although I live in London, my parents are, are from Gloucestershire in the countryside. And at that time, my brother was also dying. So I had a situation in one hospital where my brother was dying and a situation in another hospital where my child was being born. So it was, you know, stressful, of course, on, on both levels, positive and, and negative. And I remember holding my, my son in my arms and it, it was a really, strange experience because when he was born it looked like he was being born without a skull and I had my mother-in-law next to me and I just felt her grab my hand and she just started rubbing my shoulder and all, all I thought was well, well it's my child we'll love our child no matter what however long he or she lives and so forth it turned out to be a healthy boy and it was just something whereby the, the skull had to move back into a more spherical position after birth I not long held my son in my arms actually and I got a call very soon after that telling me I'd better get back to the hospital where my brother was a couple of hours away because this was looking like this was this was it and he was going to die and i'd always sort of there'd been a rallying point before that where he was supposed to die within 24 hours and i got there and he'd rallied for a couple of weeks two or three weeks actually and that was a situation of love where i got to express it myself which was which was lovely and i started reading all the old stories to him the roald dahl stories and some wonderful childhood stories that that i'd read to him when i was a lot younger and we'd enjoyed together and it was a weird sort of circular thing where i got you know he was very reconciled i felt and we we were able to just you know really make it a childlike thing again for both of us and so I was reading him stories and I got all that opportunity. Then I went back to London because my son was born. Then I got told quite seriously, I think you need to get back here if you want to see him at all before he dies. Um, and I only just made it actually. And I managed to hold his hand and whisper in his ear. And I felt great love at that time because I felt God had given us a couple of weeks. They were like bonus weeks. I don't feel we were supposed to have them. And so as much as it was a lurch for me emotionally to go from a child being born to a you know, my, my only brother dying, I felt that was, that was just enshrined in love. The whole situation was enshrined in love. <laughs> 